He was already a man when he had his first glimpse of the sea, on the first night of a voyage from Spain to Italy, when he left the harsh countryside around Toledo for the papal city of Rome. That first night on the sea introduced him into an unknown world. Suspended between earth and heaven, he found himself alone amidst the vastness of nature, able for the first time to contemplate its movements. They struck him as the embodiment of purity, that same purity he sought in music, his own art. In the night darkness, in the open sea, his ears straining skywards, he was one day to sense the music of the spheres, that sweet symphony, produced by stars and planets as they rise majestically into view, caressing each other in their courses. The years that Diego Ortiz spent in Rome were those of his greatest fame. His reputation as a virtuoso had spread beyond the city walls. His books on how to play the viola da gamba were highly regarded in Venice and beyond the Alps. One spring day in 1552, he received a package bearing the royal seal. It had been sent to him by the King of Spain in person, Charles V. It contained a book and a letter. The title page of the book bore the words... Nicolae Copernici Torinensis, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, and the letter contained a request that he go to Naples to revitalise the choir and orchestra of the Chapel Royal. Copernicus's book was to revolutionise thousands of years of thinking concerning the life of the universe, and the king's letter was to do the same for the life of Diego Ortiz, which had lasted just 30 During his time in Naples, the Magister Musicers had found only one place which could rekindle the emotions of that first night at sea, the tip of the Castel dell'Ovo. There, he felt that he was on the open sea again, and after Vespers he would go there at night when there was a new moon. With his own hands he had built himself a long bench where he could sit and contemplate the moon and listen to the sound of the sea. By performing that small, unchanging rite, he could remove himself from the dangers of public life and turn his ears trustingly towards the heavens. He would remain in this rapt state of contemplation for hours until he could hear the perfect harmony of that immensity ringing powerfully within him. Only then would he get up and go to the little chapel in the castle where he kept one of his instruments. In that same mood, he would sing and play until he was exhausted, as though he hoped to transform that grace with which he had been filled into some form of earthly music. That was his way of offering his prayers to God. On a moonless night 15 years later in 1567, he was presented with surprise. A man, his eyes set firmly on the heavens, was stretched out on his bench. Ortiz drew his sword. The glint of metal suddenly cleaved the darkness and the unknown figure stood up sharply, alarmed. He claimed to be a young Neapolitan who simply enjoyed looking at the stars 
and who had swum up to the tip of the Castel de Lova for this purpose. The young man begged for mercy and identified Jupiter, resplendent low on the horizon to the south, and these few words were enough to cause Ortiz to put down his sword, all suspicion being thus dispelled. After the publication of his Musices Liber Primus, Ortiz was convinced that he was in constant danger, because in it he had made fun of and offended Neapolitan musicians. But he felt no fear on meeting the young man who loved the stars, and he talked with him of astronomy, arithmetic, geometry and music. Before the sun rose, they had talked of the music of the spheres, and the young man had said that if Plato and Dante had ever heard Camilla Esposito singing, they would have pronounced her voice the loveliest music in the universe. Intrigued, Ortiz asked if he could hear her singing. The young Neapolitan explained that Camilla Esposito would be singing in the Church of the Annunciata at Sunday Vespers. The Annunciata was the preserve of Domenico Danola, the Neapolitan musician who transformed abandoned waifs into singers and instrumentalists. There was talk of events in which hundreds of performers took part, inducing a state of beatitude in even the most stricken souls. Music cannot work miracles, thought Ortiz to himself. Though he had been living in Naples for many years, he had never allowed himself to hear the music of the Neapolitan chapels, which he regarded with disdain. Intra angustos terminos esse positam, ut suis progenitoribus nulla similitudine sit agnoscenda. The music was so badly treated that even its own forefathers would not recognize it. Nonetheless, to somehow creep up on them and hear a snatch of it remained his heart's desire. The boy offered to go with him to the Annunciata to hear Vespers the following Sunday, and the Magister took him up on the offer. He would go in disguise, unarmed and without an armed escort. Mm -hmm. 